Hello everyone, today we talk about Augustian foreign policy. We made a video a couple of weeks ago that was about the reorganization of the Roman provinces and armies during Augustian times, so that is definitely linked to many things we will discuss today and you know if you're interested you can go back and forth and see you know how they these videos back each other uh, as an introduction and observing especially today the mm, let's say European and Oriental dimension of Augustine foreign policy um, in continuity and discontinuity with especially Caesarian strategy we can say but also in here we have to frame perhaps the, the topic in a more comprehensive context meaning that of course you know Augustus Octavian uh, at the beginning um, coming to you know to rule over these enormous territory essentially of, of Mediterranean dimension but already essentially looking at important areas of Central Europe and uh, it was come to reorganize it to give it a new um, a new basis right and the strategical problem was of course very uh, very pressing right for, for many reasons it wasn't just a strictly military matter but also a political one a social one uh, Octavian had enormous troubles to cope for example with with the problem of the veterans all these lots lots of Roman soldiers that had been fighting during the civil wars that needed land uh, at one point he, he even uh, was you know obliged to confiscate it to some other Roman citizens to, to find it and, um, and looking especially at the European perspective as the more messed up because objectively um, uh, the Roman Empire had had conquered Gaul a few decades before with Caesar had in fact already expanded in, in areas like in, in the Balkans and in the Iberian Peninsula but fundamentally was not yet stabilized. Like the northern frontier was also a, a great problem. This was e even uh, more pressing during the second triumvirate when Octavian was entrusted, in fact, with this strictly with Italy, with you know all the problems of keeping the, the the Roman mob happy and and having these barbarians at the gates, um, while Antony had had other problems right now. So we, with the, in inside, you can see that. Um, Octavian, uh, for the sake of you know brevity, we will call him uh, Augustus now without distinguishing at every time. Um, objectively, was following uh, the footsteps of his adoptive father and, and uncle, Julius Caesar, taking also his name, as you know. And and yet, and and this is very important to understand. Despite he objectively continued during the civil wars to taking you know his his uh, father's side, and uh, initially backing uh, Antony uh, against the Caesar seeds, and eventually, of course, fighting against Antony himself. At that point, it was a clash between Caesarians, right? Uh, he had made he had naturally. Uh, bet a lot on the legacy of Caesar, not just because he had left him, you know, uh, as a uh, heir of, of his most of, of his huge fortune, and this is always very important to, to, to bear in mind that uh, Caesar, in the man he was, and the things he'd done in his life, he spotted in this um, adolescent uh, an incredible talent that uh, Octavian would prove indeed to be worth of. Um, and he, you know, and, and, and therefore f feeling the need to legitimize his own mm, political figure, also in the Augustian evolution, it would take uh, place eventually, um, as, in fact, the one who would continue Caesar's legacy. But this perspective is also overly stressed in, in, in which measure, actually. Not that it's not true, actually, of course it is true, but by the fact that... Um, I don't know. There is this sense as if as if Octavian was the guy that stuck more to the Western model, to the ancient Roman values, etc. While Antony, especially during civil wars, is uh, you know becoming essentially an Oriental um, tyrant dominated by Cleopatra and all this stuff. It, the, the, the reality is very different, and actually, uh, the fact that there are still there these prejudices around um, is that first of all, I'm be I'm terrifically biased in favor of Augustus. So this is not absolutely anything like saying that Augustus kind of betrayed the Roman morals and values, but he definitely gave them a, a, a new um, political and institutional 
um, environment, let's say, where they, they had they have to develop. But Antony actually was a strong Caesarian. He he actually never betrayed what was Rome, what was Caesar's view, and he was not, in fact, a revolutionary at all. Like he really changed a, a big deal in everything. Of course, was Augustus, right? And we you could talk endlessly in here, you know, how this uh, applied uh, at every le level. Uh, the, uh, the the establishment of, uh, of the Principate is something we, we haven't discussed yet, so we will have to, at one point today, we'll stick to the, in fact, to the strategic dimension, you know, what were to be Rome's um, boundaries, right, meant in, in, in the mostly possible um, uh, broad way terms, in the sense that Rome abs didn't have boundaries, because Rome's mission, right, and this was Roman mindset since the very beginning, was to conquer the world. Actually, um, it was a promise, right? The, the Romans always remembered this. The, the, after the Jews, the, the chosen people, historically speaking, in, their, in terms of their identity, of their, of their relation with the world, are the Romans, right? In, in, the, in the early medieval times, we had the Franks in, in this mindset that also was kind of very uh, Jewish-influenced uh, by the Old Testament's uh, political and military models. But the Romans were absolutely convinced by the fact that they would have had to conquer the world, but not just to conquer it, like uh, destroying everything, slaughtering everyone, but actually giving orderly dimension where all the peoples of the world, in what was effectively an ecumenic empire, universal empire, had to dwell, right? Civilized and freed, and of course there is all here. Uh, we could open enormous parentheses about it. Never underestimate here what the the conqueror uh, aggressive mindset actually is. We we have this depiction now um, from mm, you know most you know of our tr popular culture push today that we have to stress that the Roman Empire was open, was tolerant, was kind of everybody was uh, accepted. There was no differences. A actually, this is not true. The Romans had a, a radically um, a fanatic mind in this, under this point of view. They were the conquerors. The, there weren't others around. It was an exclusive concept, right? The Romans achieved enormous things in terms of extension of the citizenship at the point that r literally everybody could become a Roman citizen, but a Roman one, not something else. And of course, this this is a, actually a very complex picture, the idea, but I, I stress it because um, I want to stress, in fact, the, f the, the point that we still live um, on the wake of um, largely even of the same Augustian propaganda, right, of the Pax Romana, for example, think in this turbulent period after the civil wars, uh, where the, the Roman order is being broken, the, the world has gone upside down, everything has changed. Um, Augustus, through the um, auspicia, the, literally, you know, by mediating between the Roman people and, uh, and uh, the, the gods and the Roman people, right, and the divinity and, uh, and the people, um, restoring the order, the peace, right, and, but actually, August, the Augustan Empire was uh, marked, it was one of the most military active of the time, there were massive campaigns, uh, as we all know, in uh, think about the Pannonian, um, you know, uh, uh, the Danubian campaigns, the Cantabrian ones, the conquest of Germany. Uh, there was an enormous uh, military uh, expansion that Octavian, di uh, later Augustus, directed towards uh, a more strictly European dimension, right? Not the Eastern one that had been typical, actually, and this is the moment of discontinuity with Caesar, of previous conquerors, like from you can argue that since the time of Scipio Africanus, the the cons the, 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 the Roman, uh, let's say the Roman mindset had been dominated in in the conquerors' ideal uh, by the figure of Alexander, uh, the Hellenistic models. All these great commanders like Caesar, they they were also they they all uh, were following essentially what the ideal what Alexander had done. Alexander had gone towards the east, had uh, uh, of course conquered everything up to India basically. And given um, uh, a strictly, in fact, what would become known as an Hellenistic uh, dimension, there is also a very complex concept to to explain because it was very subtle. It, it would be 
um, interesting to see also how Rome had partially gotten this because it was mostly a, an elitary dimension, the one that brought these commanders to mostly look at the East. But it's obvious that the East was the place of riches and especially of, of the great um, intercontinental trade routes, right? Um, and uh, Augustus, in this sense, makes a choice. He decides and that the the East was important, that Rome had to affirm its own authority in there, because no people on earth could oppose the Romans. But at the same time, he more concretely understands that the borders that need to be secured are the one of the North, are the one of Central uh, of Central Europe, um, and no, no, right? And, and there is a... Um, um, a great concreteness uh, in Augustus' mm, strategic vision. Um, we often uh, misrepresent him like a guy that uh, was always, but it was kind of true actually, <laughs> probably because he didn't, he didn't have a great health. Um, seemingly at every battle, he he was always sick, and he went, you know, uh, retiring himself into swamps. Literally, I don't know why, <laughs> but it happened. For example, before the Battle of Philip. Um, and uh, but but aside from this, the uh, the, the the reality is, is different. Uh, Augustus actually understood a freaking lot about military stuff. He even wrote a, a, um, a work about on tactics that unfortunately went lost. Uh, he reorganized the Roman armed forces, as we saw in that other video that we we made uh, recently, um, in a way that that demonstrates uh, an enormous intelligence. He was not quite of a commander himself. He, uh, famously enough, uh, renowningly enough, it was Agrippa mostly that had everything done from him. Uh, this um, Roman nobleman uh, that had uh, served uh, together with Octavian since they were they were kids, they were adolescents uh, under Caesar, eventually during civil wars, etc. Um, and um, that is also an extraordinary figure today we, we will not discuss, we will have to do it in the future. But all of this for saying, looking at the transition, this is what fascinates me, and especially also looking at Caesar and what he actually thought about the East himself, because, you know, Caesar essentially, um, you know, the, the, the exploit was with, go with gold, so, so opening this continental European dimension to the Roman, uh, to the Roman Empire, um, because technically it was still an empire. This is also a bit, bit important to clarify. Rome was always a republic, officially, even during the empire. Uh, but the empire began, at least we can make it beginning, either religiously since the beginnings of Rome, like saying there was an imperium, this military faculty of Roman magistrates, uh, with, with military, uh, military power, in fact, uh, or, for example, with the establishment of the first provinces outside of Italy, that is, with Sardinia, with Sicily, etc. Um, but, um, uh, what I was saying is that, at, at that point, Ro Rome had been essentially a Mediterranean dimension, right? The, the Romans expanded in the first wave from the 3rd century uh, BC towards areas that were strongly Hellenized, in culture, they were Rome was essentially an Hellenistic power in itself. Meant uh, broad, broadly speaking, even its military culture had owed much, even to um, to to the Hellenistic to Hellenistic warfare, etc. Um, always, however, m bearing in mind that Rome always maintained its kind of own unique warfare. That everybody thinks that Rome just stole stuff from everybody. It, it's not that, and actually, that only proves that Roman warfare was already more advanced by itself because if you're not more advanced you can't do that thing you can't take someone else's stuff and use it as if you know you know you were at the same level if you are actually already not right um the but we have discussed this extensively in roman warfare playlist um so caesar and all these other i mean caesar mm, had been fighting eventually during civil wars. Yeah, he had clashed against um, eastern foes, for example, against Pontus, etc. But the, 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 the broader dimension had remained confined to uh, to the Mediterranean, essentially, and 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 this portion of central western Europe. Right. Uh, the point here, though, is that Caesar, as is famously famously known, uh, died, was assassinated before he was leaving for Parthia, right? The, the great uh, campaign against 
the part in the Arsacid Kingdom. Um, this is a very hotly debated uh, chapter that we will discuss on another occasion, but it's very meaningful because actually um, it, it, it was the dream essentially of all, uh, like since mm, Crassus had been killed and, and his legions annihilated at Carrhae, uh, the Romans had acknowledged the Parthian uh, threat, which shouldn't be overestimated, like the Parthians as such, uh, in, let's, let's say before the Sassanids, um, the Persians never ha quite had the capability of competing with Rome in the East, right? Uh, there was no way. It was always a thorn in the side for Rome, but it was never like um, a, a, you know, a threat for the unity of the Empire. The Sassanids start to become that, but from the 3rd century onwards, so for today we, we don't talk about it. But the main problem w weren't the Parthians as, you know, in their fact, in their um, obstinate uh, attempt to um, to contend the Romans to control of places like Armenia or Syria. And uh, generally speaking, this sense, all the, 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 the trade routes that passed from, as e uh, from east to west uh, in there. But rather the problem that, in fact, um, the Parthians already stood in the middle of the Silk Road, right? So this was a big problem because the land routes, um, mm, aside from certain maybe parts of north, uh, north of uh, the Iranian Plateau, and of course the, the Indian Ocean, were essentially closed to the contacts between Rome and China. And that uh, since you know, the, you know uh, several times, the, you know, the Europe and China had always um, been in contact with one with each other. And the greatest traffic from a trade point of view came from came from there. Uh, the problem, the, the enormous problem uh, with Parthia um, is is the Iranian plateau, right? Um, the Parthians expanded at one point at the expense of the Seleucids uh, in Mesopotamia. That was naturally uh, an area of ancient urbanization, extremely fertile, actually one of the the, the wealthiest areas in the world. Um, in order, and this was mostly a, a monarchic-led orientation because actually the Parthians were quite fragmented. They were a, a set of clans, right? Uh, uh, as such, they, they continued to settle peoples from the, uh, the Iranian, Iranian steppes from in the, in the Iranian plateau, etc. But the moment holds in which you, uh, you can see this better with the Sasanians, they settled, they, they built something like a um, say a centralized uh, empire of some sort is when they s they start building their own state in Mesopotamia. And, mm, think about Ctesiphon, who was their capital, etc. Um, so the Romans actually would crush the Parthians. Famously, they would do under Nero, one of the most radically underestimated and misunderstood emperors in Roman history. The Julio Claudians were all freaking amazing emperors, even even Caligula. Uh, and Nero that are usually credited just like like crazy weirdos and so on, just Fla Flavian historiographical propaganda or almost at least, <laughs> um, and um, and eventually with Marcus Aurelius and uh, Lucius Verus, um, as we know. But th the problem was always the same. You could crush the unity of the Parthian dynasty. Um, in fact, at the end of the second century, they, they would the Arsacids would enter in this crisis for which that would lead at the beginning of the third um, uh, to the, the rise of the Sasanians. That were something very, very different conceptually. That they had all a much more powerful and um, you know determined um, mindset that was also coming on the footsteps of, of the Achaemenid Empire, while the Parthians were had been fundamentally something different. Um, but it, uh, with all the continues, of course, that existed in Persia, etc. But the problem was exactly there that these peoples, albeit half, kind of half civilized, because let's be honest, the Parthians, Persians, were uh, in between the world, the sanitarized, uh, sanitarized world, and one of the steppes. Um, so yeah, they, they were kind of weaker, on average, than the Romans in these first times. The Parthians, as we've seen, especially. Uh, they weren't good, seemingly siege warfare. They they, they, they had problems. The Romans, contrary wise to, to popular interpretation, were able to defeat them in open field, right? Even against horse archery, the, the Romans coped with it pretty, pretty well. Kara is just uh, you know an example of uh, you know very bad, let's say, um, leadership, not because intrinsically now 
the 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 horse archers have found in cataphracts combined tactics that were the tactical solution nobody could beat no the romans beat them quite easily and uh, one proof of this is also that the, that the parthians preferred rightfully also for strategic reasons to simply uh, run away and to make scorched uh, land strategy rather than uh, which was pretty effective by the way and so the romans could invade mesopotamia trajan would for example uh, eventually the romans abandoned it because it was too stretched out let's say the problem was the iranian plateau how the hell do you conquer the the the, the iranian plateau right even today it's a, a problem telling the truth you know how could you invade iran we, we, the territory that it has is extremely diverse, big cities at, at the time as well, because actually there were uh, big cities already there. Um, it's a hell, of a, terrorist, hell of a terrain. How do you actually keep that? Like the Romans, if you look at where the Romans expanded, uh, effectively it was just fertile plains that could sustain, full of urbanization, support the legions, etc. When you start venturing in places like that are kind of half civilized, the thing starts getting uh, problematic. And you can see this already in Europe. Like there were some regions of Europe that stayed under Roman domination for half of a millennium and that it's as if not much had changed there after all. Thinking about regions like, I don't know, um, northern Spain or Armorica or certain parts of Britain uh, or even part of the Danubian uh, frontier. Like those weren't actually massively Romanized areas. Uh, Rome had, um, even with its, uh, you know, uh, crashing capabilities from a political and military point of view, uh, w w w let's say a, a relatively, uh, you know, mm, uh, light government, right, for those time standards. I mean, if they, if people from that time, so how, but how many tax taxes we actually pay today, you know, they would be impressed. You know, the, the world was very different. Of course, there was much less surplus. The crop rates were much lower. So it was a, uh, it was obviously a pre-industrial world. So it's not even comparable. But what I'm trying to say here is that uh, even the actual um, creation of a territorial, let's say, the rooting of a territorial domination was actually a very complicated thing at the times. Uh, the Roman Empire just like all the empires of the world at the time had mostly this strength in controlling these fertile basins and uh, you know controlling trade um, and use uh, having a military deterrent for which yeah the subjected people were fairly autonomous as long as they paid their their due to Rome and they they let uh, trade commerce uh, you know going on without problems um, and then and that's it. You know, if there was a revolt, the, the Roman legions moved, they crushed the, 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 the rebels, and, and that, that was it, right? And that's how the Romans held their empire, right? Aside from the fact that, of course, they extended this uh, civic participation to the other people, so that that's the reason why the, the Roman Empire was so uh, long-living, and that's why it was so successful, unlike others that were even, you know, they were built much more quickly, and they had um, definitely been... Uh, had conquered uh, with with uh, with arms essentially kept uh, kept people under like arms. But the Romans didn't do this. The Romans did something nobody had done before. Not even the Greeks. The Greeks were extremely um, elitistic and conservative. They, they didn't want to give their citizenship to others for any reason. The, the Romans did, and that's the reason why there's been a Roman Empire that has changed radically the world history of mankind in the way it did. Um, and the, the 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 point here. So, once again, how would you conquer Persia? Like, uh, Anthony had tried this, for example, during the Second Triumvirate, um, albeit remaining in this state of, um, you know, uh, semi-permanent warfare with Octavian, uh, in a way that was actually not, not formalized uh, the, until, it was, uh, you know, it was ac an actual c uh, war breaking out. Uh, but... Uh, had tried to expand towards the east, and that was the only escape route, right? Because Anthony had realized that, uh, yeah, the east uh, that, that he had had the same problems Pompey had had during Caesar's civil war. Um, the east was rich, but there wasn't much of a military power. The military power at the time was essentially concentrated in, in Italy, in in um, in the camps of of Cisalpine Gaul, and uh, only increasing more riches, controlling more territories, and extending. Um, control uh, over other areas could 
could essentially shift the balance um, at some point. And, and essentially, Antony's campaigns against the Parthians were inconclusive uh, at best. Uh, there was uh, there was no way to to break through, right? What, what do you conquer? This was the great problem. Like this wasn't just about conquering a couple of cities that control these fertile plains. This is about besieging fortress after fortress uh, over mountains where you know there's not much in between and with you know thousands of this uh, fortification scattered all over in an enormous territory how do you actually do it right you can uh, as we were saying before the romans crushed the parthians on multiple occasions but the persian problem remained always there because as soon as this fragmented set of clans and tribes and peoples etc it was, it was a very the, the you know, the, the part in the Senate world was very, extremely variegated, culturally speaking. But as soon as they brought something together, well, they, they restarted. Because they had these reserves, these supplies coming from the, uh, the, the, the Iranian plateau and the steppes. And there wasn't much you could do uh, about it, after all. So, with Caesar, that, um, you know, dies uh, right away before... Uh, leaving for party a lot of things have been said because um, by that point I think the Romans were obsessed literally with the myth of Alexander as we've said we know that Caesar was totally in love with Alexander he wanted to be like him and um, and that's what Alexander does he goes in the east right and so Caesar does uh, the point is that there's all the story in fact that Caesar let actually himself being assassinated um, the, there are rumors that he was probably in. He was probably sick, uh, like terminally ill. Uh, he he le he disbanded his bodyguard the day uh, he uh, he was killed, uh, March the fifteenth, uh, forty four BC, um, just for going like like a hero. At least he, he said, like if I have to die, let it be so, so that I can become a martyr for the Roman people and uh, my my hair. Octavian, like Octavian wasn't objectively one of the, the sole heirs, even Antony inherited something from Caesar, even Brutus that killed him inherited from Caesar, uh, but Octavian was the one, and in fact the the overwhelming uh, popular reaction against the Caesar seeds was was in fact brilliantly exploited by by Octavian, by, by Antony, especially at the beginning, but um, eventually it was also what backed consistently Augustin policy and, uh, and and propaganda etc and and this was uh, a great um, uh, th this is always been to to be remembered and the concept is according to me this is just an hypothesis probably Caesar had understood the unfeasibility of the conquest of Parthia like what what doing really because I don't think at that time no Roman commander had actually even thought or planned and nor I think the Romans actually ever ever thought of anything like that, like occupying the Iranian plateau, like getting rid of everybody who was in there. Like Alexander in comparison had had it um, somewhat easier in spite of the fact that of course what he did was, was incredible, but I mean in terms of strict control of Persia, uh, since uh, those were lands that had remained under a, a much larger domination that had in part disarmed those areas or at least framed them uh, under a system that had kind of a much more consistent territorial control uh, than what you find in the first century BC here like the, it's basically the Parthians that reoccupy these formerly in fact Seleucid um, territories and arriving as foreigners Basically, because it's true, of course, there were Iranian tribes that had settled into the the plateau since the you know ever like the same Achaemenids were technically Scythians themselves, um, but um, of course th this was a new domination that had to refill and restructure uh, a dominion that, that was different from the Achaemenid one. The Achaemenid one ruled from a, you know a much larger set of centers, let's say that the Parthians did. So, um, this is important to bear in mind because uh, you could, like, as Alexander, once you wiped out the um, the empire itself, uh, the the Achaemenid one, and its center and its capital and its ruling class, it, it it's done. 
basically all these territories open to you without much of a problem. In Roman times it wasn't quite like that, because in Roman times that, that area was all fragmented. The Romans had arrived there, were still the Seleucids, like the Armenians, the, the Parthians, uh, other communities um, and, and kingdoms and, and peoples, and that was much more complicated right to do like objectively it's possible the Romans could have invaded the Iranian plateau they might have even arrived to uh, achieved let's say um, um, a temporary subjugation of these tribes but the, the effort that this would have required um, would have been insane and especially in a moment right where the Romans were coming out of this long and extremely brutal period of, of, of civil wars that albeit not crippling the actual um, supplies of, of men and riches of the empire had uh, necessitated, of course, the uh, re-stabilization of this system. So at the time of Caesar, I think this was already evident. Uh, Caesar might have, of course, achieved a victory against the Parthians, maybe without even uh, invading uh, Iran. Uh, simply crushing them in open field and coming back like the victorious general that had achieved the defeat Ale Alexander had done and this reinforcing its prestige but the situation was more complicated Caesar himself was aware of the threat posed by uh, the same uh, unpacified goal and and the Germans and uh, let's not forget that Caesar himself actually had you know, opted for for the goals just after the the Senate had discarded him the the Illyrian the dimension. He wanted to 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 invade Dacia actually, like Trajan would do. Um, it, so it, the, the, we have to be able to understand here to distinguish two aspects of this story, like the political meaning of of this victories for local Roman policy and the actual strategic advantage that the Roman Empire could gain. Um, from from accomplishing certain conquests, right? So, um, actually, the same Augustus uh, at one point wanted to arrive up to India, right? And we know that the Romans, actually, like mm, Roman communities of merchants of tradesmen, had arrived up to there. There was a flourishing uh, sort of even of colonization. We know the Templum Augusti in Malabar, for example, in North uh, in Tamil area of nor north north uh, southwestern India. Um, you know, uh, the Romans traded with China uh, at that point. So, actually, when we think about the Roman Empire, we should uh, broaden the perspective that we have just basing ourselves on a kind of a um, 19th century uh, national empire kind of mm, geographical perception. Like the idea that here there was the empire and outside there was something else. Well, this is a very uh, twisted view of, of what empires were uh, at the time. Um, you can't find kings in Sogdiano, the Gre Greco-Bactrian uh, kingdoms that styled, for example, themselves in their coins as, as Augustus himself would do in Rome. Those were areas that we don't even consider normally, but that mentally, ideally, they, they conceived themselves of gravitating around Rome and kind of embracing that model. And that's how far Rome went. Rome went as far to the Urals in this sense. The Romans knew nothing, that even Russia existed, but technically to those guys did and they were uh, attracted in the orbit of Rome. Um, this is what is fascinating to, to reason like. The problem is giving stability to this cauldron, to, to this unstable system of peoples, because this is not a matter of territories as such, this is a matter of, or, or an error of communications, this is a matter of people, so people who live in there that make it difficult to actually control a territory, right? Um, so what Augustus did in this sense was actually to um, continue ideally towards the pacification or um, f recognition of authority from the eastern peoples, the, the from the same Parthians actually, but more concretely and much more wisely in this sense, stabilizing and even expanding further the northern borders. Mm. And with large success, of course, Germany was a, a major setback that made uh, the the empire bleed. But it wasn't like the the, the massive disaster, nor the actual um, externalization of Germany from from the empire forever. Like, of course, it was a, a you know a, a world changing event. The fact that the Romans 
um, gave up uh, in part because they tried uh, further back and this also reveals certain things that are actually very very interesting about it um, the, the, the Germany wouldn't be Romanized the, the, this changed like world history from from the very root uh, what could happen in with a with a Rome or partially Romanized Germany, uh, it would have been uh, in incredible, and we can only speculate on how it could have could have been, mostly for its consequences. We know he would have been mostly about not even just fighting, but actually investing an enormous amount of resources for building, 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 clearing, uh, reclamations, things like this, because Germany was uh, was a nightmare in terms of terrain etc and uh, as the Romans found out um, there's also to consider broadly speaking that they meant the, like let's say um, measures here are um, susceptible to different uh, interpretations like for example the Romans didn't have a uh, nor any other people at the time, uh, a clear understanding of how actually far was, I don't know, how large was Germany, for example, or, or how far India was. Uh, there was a, a much more, it was still a practical way of looking at the world, but let's say that um, the it's obvious that the Eastern Channel, like the idea that, that there was a trade route towards the East, was always kind of the most prevalent thing. The Romans took enormous pride from reaching the far north of Europe, and saying, you know, we, we arrived to conquer lands not w in which not even the gods in mythology ever set foot. This is there was well, uh, there was allegedly true in, in in Hellenic mythology for for Britain, for example. Um, the, 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 and and the Romans felt proud of having uh, created this dimension. And of course, the, the, even the concept of modern Europe owes much to the same empire in part uh, not much because of, of the Roman conceptualization because Europe wasn't conceived as we, we do today of course and nor it would be for until you know very very far into the, the Middle Ages uh, starting to be actually um, and the, the, the concept of Europe we have today is largely a modern oh, a Western modern one right um, but of course, the consequences that this European dimension of the empire, uh, the, the, this direction of expansion, let's say, had are massive. Have been massive, like the the history of large amounts of Europe. It doesn't matter whether they were actually included into the Roman Empire or not. But this realization that the Roman Empire couldn't be just like a copy of the uh, the Alexandrian Empire, but it had to expand further. Um, was in, in a certain sense un unavoidable. It was unavoidable also because of the political uh, mechanisms of of the Roman Empire itself. Like uh, extending a citizenship is something you you can't do when when you can't commit someone to uh, to to its participation to. Um, and the, the the geographical proximity in this sense is very very important, right? Think about. Uh, Augustus wanting to to invade India, ideally, but thinking in fact between India and and uh, and Mesopotamia, the Near East, where the Romans arrived, uh, there is the, the whole Iranian plateau it arrives up to Pakistan, right? So it's not like you jump from Mesopotamia, uh, from the fertile valleys of the Tigris and Euphrates to the fertile valleys of Indus and Ganges. No, you you have to get through uh, uh, an enormous amount of territory that is not like that and you can't control like you would Mesopotamia or India right um, Alexander once again could afford that because uh, in between there were other people's other situations right than at the time of, of, of Caesar or Augustus um, and he would go back to India we know that and it made sense by any standard for the Alexandrian Empire to extend up to India no, they could have achieved it telling the truth it, it was relatively like it wasn't easy as such, but it, it was feasible, okay? Um, but you see, for example, in that context that Alexander, before doing that, was more preoccupied with now securing, for example, Arabia. Um, and the, the, the campaign for which was preparing before dying. And eventually he, we know he, he wanted to go against Carthage, right? He, he actually didn't give a damn about Europe more than much. Um, but the concept is here that uh, the, the times had changed, um, peoples had changed, and, and therefore the, the empire had, in a certain sense, to betray the old 
uh, Hellenistic promise of 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 the East, of this mysterious or, or and, and yet extremely um, wealthy and and rich Eastern lands to give itself a more robust and steady and and functional base that was in Europe and many of you will say well okay well but eventually the Byzantine Empire shifted like towards the east towards this um, yeah but that's another story and that also considers other factors that happened afterwards including certain problems that the Roman Empire had in itself that could have been you know if not solved I mean the story might have also gone differently and after all the myth that the western half of the empire was doomed like to disappear is is a myth um, and um, it it happened actually very very randomly and very quickly and it technically could continue on much more than it actually did but we will comment it on another occasion um, of course um, there was a continuity also between uh, Augustus and Caesar's foreign policy in this sense because Caesar as we said before had opened to Gaul, right, had conquered Gaul uh, in a, a very few time. He had already warned the Britons and the Germans to stay the freaking out of the way, right, and that's why Caesar actually sent, yeah, c actually invaded the two without aiming to firmly occupy them, but for saying to those guys, this is no joke, and that's the reason why, for example, I don't know, the Britons at the time of Augustus still were kind of under the Romans like even the Germans were more unruly more difficult to um, to 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 frame this system were actually invaded under Augustus and for 20 years were, uh, were under actual direct uh, Roman domination before the battle of Ceutopor forced um, uh, at the same time um, there were these other peoples to like the Pannonians like uh, the Cantabrians to keep at bay and to kind of um, there were other problems in the Alps, as close as Italy, like these Alpine peoples that lived, uh, you know, up, you know, in the in the highlands. That that the Roman legions even had, of course, difficulties, like any other army at the time, to, to even dislodge or to, you know, mm, the the wounds of civil war were too fresh. Rome had the strengths to achieve other great things, but it had to take brave hands. It, they couldn't uh, involve themselves into massive conquests of campaign and faraway lands in places like the Middle East, right? And they and Rome for the asset, and also we will uh, we will talk about it now. Like also for when did Augustus decide to to take another decision, but uh, another direction? Excuse me, but also to um, to, to stop there and to actually preserve what had been conquered because objectively uh, an empire uh, the larger an empire is and, and the more difficult it actually becomes to, to of course to maintain it to preserve it to extend it further and it in part it doesn't even make sense and if you wonder why the Romans objectively in their history stayed there like for centuries like if you see what was happening in China it was much more messy for example the Romans stayed there like the even the, the 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 problems that happened since, since the uh, you know the crisis of the third century, all these peoples in movement weren't objectively an enormous deal. Like there, there were ways the Romans even managed to cope with it, and what happened afterwards was mostly the um, even the consequence of uh, internal Roman um, or say of Roman infight. Uh, but this is another story we won't be commenting on, and. To go back at what was a, uh, was a uh, hinting at, at the beginning about the ferociousness of the Roman conquest and the aggressiveness of the, their imperialism, um, there is a beautiful passage that, however, uh, th that is the by Sallust, uh, written around 66 BC, so a bit before the time we are discussing today, but still meaningful to to show us, and even more meaningful in this sense, how far the Romans had gone in understanding the um, you know the, the exceptionality of what Rome had been able to achieve right the, there are beautiful passages in, in uh, Roman literature about Roman imperialism that is 
that are written by the same Romans, right? And that are written in this sense, not because of kind of self-criticism, I mean in part, uh, like realizing the uh, the uh, crudity, if you want, and the uh, the violence that this uh, conquests meant in practice, but also observing this as still part of the divine mission that the Romans had uh, in in their in their fate, in their destiny, and that these other peoples uh, that complain about it um, didn't didn't essentially understand. Like when when we quote Tacitus, we say I don't know or those passages, for example, when. I don't know, they, they, they make it a desert and call it peace. Everybody quotes it to say, oh, look at the Romans, they, they make the desert, they slaughter everyone, evil, bad. But unfortunately, those are quotes from, um, not from a criticism against Roman imperialism, but against the um, barbarian, th they are actually a pro-imperialist view uh, that uh, shows at that point, in fact, that the barbarian speaking and saying, ah, these Romans, just what all they want is to conquer. We should fight against them, we should be free, right? And and the point there is the Roman showing that these barbarians do not understand that they're fighting against the deity, that they're fighting against <laughs> the gods that had allowed Rome to conquer the world, literally the whole world. Always remember this. The the fact that, that the Roman Empire had a, an extension doesn't mean anything in terms of you know that that whether that was a world empire or not, Rome had literally conquered the whole known world, because for them that's what it was, and for the other people that's what it was. One fourth of Roman popu of the world population lived under Rome um, at the time. The, the, the greatness of, of of this empire couldn't be contested, right? And and that also tells you how Rome had taken essentially that European and Mediterranean dimension that would maintain historically even with uh, with uh, its consequences right with the western civilization with uh, and of course also being the product of other civilizations as well uh, the Hellenic one chiefly but not all you know think about the encompassment of all these other populations the, the, the Celts later the Germans etc so uh, this is important to bear in mind and I will read this in Latin first the letter to Mithridates the king of Pontus, exactly, um, writing to the uh, the Parthian king Arsaces the twelfth, right. So these are actually the the, the, the historical contemporaries of of uh, Sallust, and uh, you know in the times before, where the, this speech is taking place, with this letter being sent, and here Mithridates is essentially talking to the Parthian king about the Romans, right? And th the Parthians and the Romans had actually met, in part. Um, it, it didn't happen with Cairo first. The very first things began exactly in those years, if I'm not wrong, in the 60s of the 1st century BC. And uh, and therefore, and these people were just getting acquainted. And of course, Mithridates, that is a Hellenistic ruler, because fundamentally he's not, strictly speaking, um, a Greek, but uh, his part of Pontus was massively Hellenized and having uh, w being part of this broader Hellenistic model of, of rule, etc. So uh, this is very interesting also from an uh, ethno-anthropological point of view. So in Latin that would sound something like, this is theoretically my, my classical pronunciation of it, so if you are used to the, the ecclesiastical one, don't, don't get scared. But, um, so, nunc quaeso considera nobis oppressis utrum firmiorem te ad resistundum an finem belli futurum putas, scio equidem tibi magnas opes virorum armorum et auri esse, et ea re a nobis ad societatem ab illis ad praedam peteris. Ceterum consilium est. Tigranis regno integro meis militibus belli prudentibus procul ab domo per nostra corpora bellum conficere, quoniam neque vincere neque vinci sine tuo periculo possums. An ignoras romanos postquam ad occidentem per gentibus finem oceanus fecit arma uc convortisse, neque quiquam a principio nisi raptum habere, 
Dum, uh, domum Maconiuges Agros Imperium, convenas olim messine patria parentibus peste conditos orbis terrarum, quibus non umana ulla neque divina obstant, quin socios amicos procul juxtasitos, in opes potentisque trahant excidan, excindant, excuse me, uh, omniaque non serva et maxume regne hostilia ducant, nam pauci libertatem pars magnea justos dominos volunt, nos suspecti sumus aimuli et in tempore bindices ad futuri. So, beautiful piece of literature that now we translate. So, this is actually just a part of the letter towards the end. Maybe one day we could read it all, but this is, as you understand, Mithridates to the Parthian King Arsaces the Twelfth. It says, I pray you then to consider whether you believe that when we have been crushed you will be better able to resist the Romans or that there will be an end to the war. I know well that you have great numbers of men and large amounts of arms and gold and it is for that reason that I seek your alliance and the Romans your spoils. Yet my advice is, while the kingdom of Tigranes is entire, this is one of the Armenia, um, and while I still have soldiers who have been trained in warfare with the Romans to finish far from your homes and with little labor, at the expense of our bodies, a war in which we cannot conquer or be conquered without danger to you, do you not know that the Romans turned their arms in, in this direction only after Osin had blocked their westward progress, that they have possessed nothing since the beginning of their existence except what they have stolen, their home, their wives, their lands, their empire, once vagabonds without fatherland, without parents, created to be the scourge of the whole world, no laws, human or divine, prevent them from seizing and destroying allies and friends, those near them and those afar off, weak or powerful, and from considering every government which does not serve them, especially monarchies, as their enemies. Of a truth, few men desire freedom, the greater part are content with just masters. Right? This is one of the single um, most uh, beautiful um, passages from uh, Latin literature, in my opinion, and it tells you so much. It tells you so much about, uh, in fact, what was the, the Roman understanding of what these uh, of the, these peoples were, right? And here, um, Sallust is uh, showing with, you know, with evidence of art, but, you know, indirectly, but still very concretely, the threat that the Parthians posed to the Romans, right? Or in here, you can see that the Parthians are addressed by the king of Pontus as the ones that had, you know, men, power, and that could oppose themselves to Rome, right? But always warning Arsaces of the Roman might. And what is extraordinary in this letter is, uh, first of all, you, you can recognize the fact that the Romans, as early as, as this point in the first half of the, uh, of, the uh, of the first century BC, but even you know consistently before the same Battle of Carrhae, consisted the Parthians as as a threat. Like they, they realized that if they wanted to step in the Near East, which they had already done, the Parthians uh, were would would be a problem, right? And the Parthians at this point were busy, o preoccupied essentially by dynastic conflicts in, at one point and uh, not really intervening immediately against Rome, but as you know, the Romans created this, that they first extended the protectorate over the Celsius that entrusted the, the Armenians, that the guidance of certain areas. Um, here was actually a very complicated uh, scenario in which um, you one day we'll have to, to dig into because it's, it's very fascinating and uh, fairly overlooked, unfairly I would say overlooked. And um, But the, the, the most beautiful thing here is that the the Roman perspective on the barbarians that recognize that basically the Romans are different from anything they've ever seen. Like, they are... So here it says, uh, okay, uh, the first part of the part is, but the, the most important thing here is when it says, do you know, uh, do you not know that the Romans turned their arms in this direction, that is the east, only after 
Ocean had blocked their westward progress. Right here, so Rome is, is uh, pictured like a giant oil a stain that expands, uh, uh, you know, everywhere, and that only the ocean can can stop this this uh, uh, affordable barrier stops right. And now they they come to the east, and and here the the Romans as the latrones of the world. The, the latter in, in Latin is essentially the the most infamous uh, spoiler, the, the common thief, but also you know the, the criminal in general. In fact, it, it, it normally to these individuals was reserved crucifixion, as you know, it was the lowest form for the, like for slaves, rebels, and these people that had done really something against the, the civil order, right? Um, the Roman citizens had the privilege of being decapitated, which is what <laughs> was another thing, objectively better than the dying crucified. Um, and, and, and so here, uh, this is a Roman writing to show that what the Romans are doing with their empire is not understood by other peoples, but in terms of crime. Like, and, and this is the real crime, paradoxically, because these peoples do not recognize that Rome is conquering the world, because it's meant by the gods to conquer the world. So if you oppose Rome, you're inherently fighting against a god that is stronger. This is the whole deal of the whole Roman Empire. This has nothing to do with the civil idea. The, 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 the whole core of, of the concept of empire is that the Romans have to conquer the world. First of all, then they think about the rest. First they have to conquer it in arms, right? And here, Mithridates says, you know, the, the Romans have had nothing since the beginning but what they stole their home, their wives, their lands, the emperor. This is the reference actually to the old cliche, I mean the fact that Romulus objectively had taken, you know, sub as, uh, the famous raptus of the Sabine women, that the Romans had emerged as a band of mortars. Like it was the ancient war like um, uh, Italic Indo European culture in the sense of this man that went outside of the tribe, uh, seizing other people's lands and women and generating this idea of the fact that the Romans were mixed, right? That they didn't belong to a stock since the beginning. They were this mix of um, Latins, Sabines, a uh, bit of Etruscans, a pinch of Greeks, right? You know, that this um, uh, people that apparently had had no no belonging, right? It was the stereotype of the you know, of the Romans, like the, the wanderers. Here it says, once vagabonds without fatherland. This is the typical idea of the, uh, the stereotype of the barbarian itself, of the Indo-European nomad, right? Uh, these bands of warriors that came from nowhere, from the steppe, from Central Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, that had swarmed into these territories that were, he said, more ancient, right? Um, the th this is kind of, of course, we can't take it too far because, of course, there's uh, as we were saying before, the, the Parthians were kind of the same thing. Um, but just just for saying, however, how Rome was perceived, like the new arrivals that were m more ferocious than everyone else, without without anything that hadn't been taken, without without morals, because here it says, once vagabonds without fatherland, without parents created to be the scourge of the world world the Romans created to be the scourge of the world world no laws human or divine prevent them from seizing and destroying allies and friends right this this is another thing that, that, that which is actually very realistic in the sense that um, the Romans always knocked at you know they they were a bit like um, the, the next door bully that eventually seizes your, your house and passes to the next neighbor's house, right? And, and that's what literally Rome had been, right? And it was perceived in a way, however, that of course the Romans thought of very differently. And in fact, we don't have to be... This is not a criticism to Rome, meaning that of course I even Pontus, even the Parthians conquered whatever they can, they wanted. <laughs> you know, wh 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 what what is the law? What is human or divine law here? Nothing. You know, everybody believed um, that they were invading um, and conquering by human and divine, especially uh, law at the time. Every single people, 
uh, there was no single exception in there and of course the others said ah oh, no you're doing it because you're just without morals and you do it unfairly and one day the gods will take revenge well Rome you know <laughs> did something probably you know if, if there is any god f favor in this in this context you know probably they got it right as they conquered in fact uh, the, the whole world and, and and this fact that they al they attack basically allies in France, right? This is also we could make all a video about Roman um, foreign policy in the first century, let's say the first half of the first century BC, where we see how you know yeah even those who were dealt like with France of Rome and they were actually just blackmailed. Um, and and of course in in international policy like in policy in general like what's what's a friend actually right it's just a tool right and it what is interesting very very interesting actually here is when it says that they, they consider every government which does not serve them especially monarchies as their enemies now this made me realize in fact something that here is pro possibly a self-realization from the time of Sallus, that actually the Romans had more sympathy, which is objectively true, towards the uh, tribal peoples than towards monarchies, right? The, the Romans uh, were themselves a tribal people. The tribes were still part of the, uh, you know, electoral system of, of the Roman, uh, of the Roman uh, Republic, Roman citizenry. The 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 whole concept is that the, the the Rome had emerged from those bands of warriors. That it wasn't about a monarchy that had the, the Romans rejected monarchies. Even if uh, at this point the Republic was was in necrosis, and these warlords like the first triumvirate and the second and eventually Augustus would would emerge right um, as effective monarchs um, in, in de facto right. Uh, even if the institutional form was still republican, read oligarchic, right? And uh, therefore, the, but this is true that the Romans actually were much more sympathetic towards peoples like the Gauls or, or or the Germans, for that matter, than towards these Hellenistic monarchies because they they found them as something essentially different from them, um, as uh, not even especially these ones like Pontus and. Uh, I don't know Parthia as not even successors of the you know of the of Alexander, um, so something they didn't have to tribute much regard of the role, right? And the Romans thought they were the freaking best around and that they were the, the toughest guys and the, the best warriors and the best people ever, right? And they recognized, however, that there were other peoples that esteemed freedom in the sense. This is very interesting, also in terms. W of what the Romans perceived freedom like, like they, they had a very dual perception of what 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 it was conceived. Because formally they were republicans themselves, they were, um, uh, you know, uh, that they had this sense of shared of the idea of freedom that there is no Roman that is superior to another. It's the uh, it's the deity that leads the Roman victorious Roman commanders in in battle um, uh, to that that effectively confers that extra power. But every Roman is the same because the, the Roman belonged to this um, stock that, albeit with, without no clear tracing, has been elected by the deity to to conquer the world, right? And and they saw in other peoples fighting to the death in their barbarity, like I don't know the the, the Celts or the Germans could be like oh, these are cool guys because they they don't give up. They don't give up. They 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 don't quit, right? Uh, this other Hellenistic monarchs, they they kind of they care much more about remaining on their throne. They they will kind of um, condescend with with Rome because that they, they want to keep their autonomous government. And this is how r the Romans actually absorbed them ma way more easily than they did with with the Germans or the, the even s certain Celtic peoples. Um, instead, the Celts and the Germans say nuts. They they would fight to the death, and and the Romans were totally uh crazy about this that they loved it as hell because they recognized in that their 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 own origins the idea that um, a, a true warrior would never would never surrender would never accept um a fake freedom right and that's why the romans f were so close in also ethnographically speaking they wrote so much about uh the gauls the germans because they saw in them what the romans have been in the past 
Uh, th this is very meaningful. And this letter, okay, maybe we will make an entire video about this letter only because there would be so much more to say from it. Um, but these, uh, this letter is, you know, one of the best uh, passages of the Historia that have, um, uh, you know, survived from Sallust. Uh, and uh, they they saw that point that uh, it shows that that the Parthians were already considered as a problem. Now this is very interesting because the 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 Vulgata is like ah the Romans arrived in in, in Mesopotamia they, were, they felt so cocky and uh, arrogant and they they, they met this part and said wow what the hell they are and then they they got annihilated because they were stupid like uh, it wasn't like that and um, the Romans already knew that the Parthians were ac an actual problem. That's what Crassus went there a in the first place. Then how the battle was managed, objectively, yeah, it was poor, poor leadership. But at the same time, not even this immense, like it wasn't even a big deal for Rome itself. Like lo losing true legions, like in the first in the mid uh, first century BC, is like doesn't make a scratch to Rome. Um, and the the point here, however, is that everybody in Rome be, mm, had this opinion towards the Parthians. Uh, even those that considered like adventures or absurd the Parthian plans of Caesar and Antony, right, uh, had, uh, they, they recognized that the Parthians were a thorn in the side. And, and that's why, in fact, um, these, um, let's say, Caesar and Antony's ambitions were kind of bombastic, they were you know, uh, this clear propaganda moves, per se. For, for Antony, not so much, because Antony, as we were saying, was stuck in the East, and for a while, uh, before he he was defeated, and, and that was the only way uh, out of that situation, like, either you fight against the Parthians or not, with Caesar, it was wholly different, and eventually he, he died before he could accomplish it, so actually nobody except Crassus had ventured there um, with the actual uh, intention of accomplishing something and even in there we should actually see more in detail how, wh what the whole thing was about um, but um, there is also th this question that uh, also makes sense up to a certain point that is um, what would have been the, the, the ancient world if Caesar or Antony had crushed the Parthians, right? And we know, of course, as we were saying before, that th those territories of Parthia were were tough to control. But uh, they could the, the Sassid dynasty could be broken uh, early, right? And uh, the history could have gone differently. Maybe not so much, but still enough to to make a certain difference. For example, beyond the Parthian monarchy, there was Bactria and India. Right, those regions were up to, um, respectively, uh, 130 BC and uh, uh, roughly, at least, and uh, roughly 90 BC. Um, splendid Hellenic states had flourished. Uh, regions of um, essentially Indo-Iranian um, and Hellenistic culture. Right, the Roman, uh, let's say, the Roman Hellenistic culture. Would would have not realized uh, a more organic, modern version of the largely human conception of Alexander. Like this was feasible. Like theoretically, w the, the Romans knew that there were other peoples beyond the Parthia. That there could be um, uh, the need of crushing these guys sooner or later if they wanted to achieve this. Alexandrine dream, right? And um, the Alexandrine dream is is very uh, is very subtle. I don't know even how much the Romans fully fully embraced it. Like probably not up, up to a certain time, yes. But possibly the reason why the Romans wouldn't venture in there is it's that they also probably weren't fully kind of Hellenistic in that regard. There was still a Latin, Italic mindset, and all these peoples in Europe. In fact, they were still to to be framed. They, they came from somewhere else. They had surely known about Alexander, but not at the point that they would trade their own 
future for achieving this massive feat of you know crushing Parthia and reuniting everything from Bactria to India that you know for Rome like it, it's too complicated and uh, probably it didn't make sense strategically uh, uh, especially in those in the conditions that we have can trying to 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 delineate so if Augustus wanted to concrete his ideal of Pax he had to resolve the Parthian problem anyway right so this is was a, this was a great challenge it couldn't be left unsolved like Augustus ruled fair you know with, we can't say with iron fist but you know he was pretty um, he was pretty incisive in his policy he had to affirm himself over the senatorial class and real making them realize that they had their own space but he was the guy in charge that he was the leader um, the the internal balance in Rome required these r new role to be backed by a success by the the achieve an achievement that could be at at the level of um, Octavian's ambitions, right? So, um, the he Octavian realized, uh, having been born in the first century BC and having lived through the civil wars, etc., that the history of Rome, especially in its international dimension, was in great part the hi uh, uh, at that point the, the history between. Uh, the uh, the history of the relations between Rome and the Parthian kingdom, right? Um, and that's why he he decided to to solve it, but essentially from a diplomatic level, right? The, 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 it it would have been way more disastrous for him to venture there to achieve nothing because that was what very likely would have happened in those conditions. So. There were, of course, even military uh, measures. Uh, it wasn't just like diplomacy, but uh, diplomacy uh, um, entailed Augustus also to mount up this uh, this uh, propagandistic um, um, picture. Let's say that was the recovery of Crassus' eagle. Right, those were sacred symbol of uh, of Jupiter Capitolinus, and uh, it they were the honor of Rome. So that's also why um, that uh, there was this pressure, politically speaking, especially from the elites, we can't, the senatorial elites that had bled because of, a, of Octavian and that, that rightfully feared him to say, okay, if you're really so great, why don't you get our eagles back, right? And that was the real deal. And, um, and the diplomatic solution, of course, didn't close this because of course for who knows Roman imperial history we like you know that the Parthians were always there and that albeit crushed uh, reverted to you know uh, resume that their their uh, attempts against Rome for the control of the Near East etc um, but definitely I think that in terms of realpolitik and of of concreteness and vision the most prudent and wise solution would be to solve this without largely without arms like and that's why in 20 BC the Parthian king Fratus the fourth gave back to Tib Tiberius the insignia of crosses right that are in fact rep famously uh, represented on Augustus Quirus in the famous statue um, uh, coming from the villa of Livia at Prima Porta uh, it's most famous depiction of Augustus and uh, this was a, a great um, a great uh, achievement that, that was possible thanks to internal party and policy right uh, party wasn't faring very well was always um, as we have seen before it, it wasn't actually a set of different uh, clans that uh, you know were constantly struggling for you know for, for power it was that the Arsacid dynasty had managed to, to keep them under but you know there were problems and even within the same uh, within the same Arsacid dynasty actually for who could uh, rise to and uh, in there was also the great problem of Armenia that 
in this sense uh, was in between Rome and Parthia and that uh, represented a bit the political thermometer of of the Near East um, in the year 1 AD um, in order to avoid new contrasts relatively to, to Armenia the successor of Phratas the fourth his um, son Phratax or Phratas the, the, the fifth um, also condescended to having a conversation with you know have some negotiations with Gaius Caesar right in neutral territory and here uh, uh, this was chosen in, in an island of the Euphrates River right and uh, Gaius Caesar of course being uh, Augustus um, nephew and these conversations um, achieved essentially a sound diplomatic victory of Augustus in the Armenian matter, right? And after a while, on the diplomatic basis posed by Augustus, the Parthian kingdom, governed by the uh, legitimate branch of the Arsacid dynasty, seemed to go towards uh, never greater dependence on the Roman state, right? There was no need at the time why the Romans should have not dealt with the Parthians in a different way than they, they did with any other Hellenistic power, right? After the negotiations with Gaius, Fra uh, Fratax um, could consider um, um, his dynasty as a kind of a Romanizing one pro excellence. Like, you know, that this had happened in on other, you know, many other powers, like that. The Romans would back a candidate, uh, I mean, a you know, a leader of a, of a civil war during a civil strife. So he would seize the throne, and he would rule on behalf of Rome that had, nat had naturally supported um, uh, him, and that would progressively Romanize, a uh, kind of being co-opted by the Roman, the Roman state, and progressively making this land being absorbed into the Roman also into the Roman market and trade, because that was the, the main way it was achieved. This, this was a problem with Parthia, because objectively, uh, trade routes were, were all, most of the deal between the, the, the two powers, in the sense that uh, the, the Parthians controlled those territories, uh, even if Rome didn't want it, right? So, uh, the, of course, Rome would put pressure in them, would, uh, would cause major troubles on the western frontier, but at the same time, there was not much more they could do. So these systems were quite delicate and, and, and Rome at the time had to deal also with other neighbors that weren't that easy to control either. So uh, the reason why Rome couldn't cope uh, sometimes more uh, radically with, with this problem was exactly the, the fact that, you know, objectively Rome even had a few men controlling um, it their own treasuries. I mean, uh, if you consider just, um, they didn't have so many troops after all. They just had 125,000 legionaries and another number of of um, of, of auxiliaries. I mean, it, it, considering the dual territory, and considering the fact that during Augustian times, actually, that there were lots of wars in Europe, the Eastern problem needed to be dealt essentially like that. I am very supportive of what Augustus did in this sense. And he achieved this, like for, for a, initially speaking, like great part of his foreign policy actually went pretty well. It was a great success, right? Um, but this Romanizing direction that the Arsacids took, however, couldn't, couldn't, uh, not even with the European, uh, excuse me, the, the Augustan bases, to undermine the Parthian, let's say, national pride, right? That would be revealed later on in the very last times of, of Augustus and also during the uh, the Principatus of Tiberius, right? And we'll see it another time. But it's obvious that when uh, the Pannonian Revolt or Illyrian Revolt broke out and when the, the Romans were were thrown out of Germany. And, uh, you know, at this point, the Eastern Front was in a condition for being revived by, by the Parthians. 
and to to revert to their initial uh, ambitions that ha they never gave up the, the the partings objectively never gave up their ambitions they, they didn't matter that they were kind of the weaker part they always thought they were entitled to to obtain uh, against Rome in, in that in that regard um, but there is also another uh, aspect of Augustus Eastern uh, policy right that has to be considered in fact uh, under the light of all the various branches of the Silk Road as we've seen of course Persia was in the very middle of the Silk Road but there were other branches passing north and south and and Augustus quite cleverly decided to expand towards those directions given that uh, there weren't objectively great powers uh, in, in the area and that partly those same regions kind of were you know uh, in favor of progressive Roman uh, commercial penetration they, they didn't um, you know if, if they blocked their own trade would, would, would they would trade with like that it was a problem so and and these areas are kind of over overlooked. Um, first of all, the Bosphoran state uh, is kind of overlooked. It was a state that had been formed essentially by uh, a mix of uh, Hellenic and Scythian um, uh, dominions that had incorporated, had also been part of uh, the same Pontic um, kingdom at one point. Um, and this was a very important area because, as we know, the great uh, rivers of Russia, the great plains of uh, of the Ukraine, um, are directly close to, to this land. It's mostly today's southern the southern coast of the Ukraine and uh, Crimea, etc. And uh, these were areas of ancient Hellenic colonization as well, and a lot of trade routes passed from there as well. Right at one point, Nero would even uh, organize an expedition to you know to, to s secure th this wide area this great grain supply right that, th that would become very important especially later on for Constantinople when when Egypt and Syria uh, and Palestine were lost to 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 the Muslims um, at this time Rome actually relied massively on Egypt for, for its grain supplies and part of Africa um and the this controlling this area was however equally important because um the Bosphoran kingdom was still at, at the borders with um the steppes where that that also the Romans wouldn't venture in because it would have been useless um in terms of they were devoid of any um, you know element that could sustain uh, romanization at that point and the uh, the point that was controlling directly the ends of this trade routes and kind of getting most of the grain coming from there and in this sense consolidating this broader Pontic dimension towards which the same Parthians had essentially um, pushed in, in part I mean um, after Armenia it was Colchis and that was it right so um, um, the Caucasus that area w w was possibly um, um, you know kind of a problem for for the Romans and they wanted to at least consolidate the domination on the Black Sea so that they could stabilize the, the whole the whole region uh, from from their side and also of course encircling um, the Balkans that of course were you know between them um, the the Adriatic and the Black Seas and that um, at this time had largely dependent in fact before the Roman conquests on the trade with uh, with the Atlantic world that had in fact even opened them I mean countries like Dacia like Trace to to Hellenization and therefore to the the feasibility of a further Roman expansion now um, there is other uh, also Galatia this area in the in the very heartland of the Anatolian plateau uh, that was incorporated by the Romans in 25 BC right the Romans had not ventured into the Anatolian plateau before like but progressively it had fallen into I mean, given that the Romans had consolidated their presence on the coasts it would simply be absorbed uh, the Gauls had settled there famously enough the Galatians had given the, the name to the region in this sense 
and that would be romanized with success and also being integrated into broader Hellenistic cultural uh, picture of the surrounding regions um, that helped to consolidate in fact what would become one of the most uh, solidly romanized um, provinces of the one of Asia Maya. I mean there were several provinces but you know the, that was like especially on the coasts um, you know the, the most after Italy the most intensely romanized areas were southern France southern Spain uh, what would be today's Tunisia uh, and and uh, let's say Asia Minor in the sense of of course of Greece as well and all this broad massively Hellenized or urbanized area that was also very rich and populated and that would be the base of what would become the Eastern Roman Empire eventually um, so mm, there was also this this Pontic dimension I think is very important and overlooked and we have to expand it on, on a dedicated video but the other one is definitely the one of India the problem of the commercial route towards India that as we were saying before is um, it, it was was a, a big deal because we know that there was the Templum Augusti in, in the Malapar so uh, this is witnessed by the Peutingerian uh, table that shows the remarkable extension of Roman uh, factories right they were called Yavana by by the Indians that means that the Greeks right because they didn't distinguish they, these were all Westerners like so they came from there they spoke this language they looked kind of similar and oh, yeah they, they were called like this thing this Tamil area that of course was not the, the most advanced of India um, but that exactly in this hands had probably um, been penetrated by Rome which also was very careful about the internal um, trade routes uh, like of, excuse me of the trade route the mar maritime trade route with China so these were mostly maritime and posts the we don't know that the Romans didn't we don't have any evidence of Romans entering in, in India probably in the continent um, and uh, so this however shows how close the Romans had actually gotten to so these commercial needs uh, that were all ever greater for Rome especially after the conquest of Egypt right that that opened several paths right uh, to the Romans determined in part the Roman campaigns against Ethiopia the kingdom of Meroe that would be and Arabia during the years 25 22 BC right these campaigns um, were actually th th these are massively overlooked we wouldn't know why um, by us to technically it's because they were far away but actually th these were a problem because Ethiopia had gravitated around the, the, the Ptolemaic kingdom when the Romans finally annexed uh, Egypt they uh, th this th the Ethiopians kind of tried to to go north and to start raiding those areas they met the Romans that pushed them back like there, there is the famous Queen Candax you know there's probably a mythical figure but it, it, it speaks about um, Ethiopian elites that uh, were mm, capable of um, bringing their control of those those areas and that also to to accept and this is important Rome's preeminence there domination in there and remaining at their place eventually Ethiopia also being thriving, uh, flourishing center um, between Black Africa and the, the 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 Red Sea, and in fact between the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean uh, proper in this trade routes were dramatically important, and that's how rich they got. Also pretty close to Arabia, that in the southwest especially was pretty damn advanced, um, and that's why the Romans pushed towards Arabia as well because they knew that. Um, those um, this is actually in Nabatea mostly um, but the the extension of these mm, operations d d geographically speaking doesn't have to be underestimated there were pretty harsh campaigns as well right um, this is witnessed uh, seemingly by Meroitic inscriptions um, one of in fact um, uh, in one of these this Queen Candax uh, the Amani Renas uh, 
seems to, to boast to have made prisoner a keper a, into which um, into whom some scholars have uh, individuated let's say um, a Roman vassal of the Triacontas Coinos right and and therefore th there was this mm, frontier uh, that was progressively stabilized under Augustian times and Augustus in his res gestae so in his deeds and in this great that, that express in fact this great reorganization of the known world under Roman Roman arms claims that um, in Ethiopia uh, the Romans reached um, uh, in Latin it's opidum nabata cui proxima est meroi right that is um, but technically this this would be napata right N napata would be uh, say say 25 skoinoi north of meroi in um, from the other side he says that in Arabia had been reached the opidum mariba all right um, these were pretty far away so it's possibly propagandistic actually but I in any way the basis uh, for the relations between Rome and Nubia remained constant for um, uh, from the time of Augustus uh, for a long period of the Principate up to the you know mid third century third century actually and we can in fact say that the history of Nubia is also the history of the Roman control over the Dodecas coinos right and, and in within which seems to can be part of it also the triacontas coins. Now, why these areas actually didn't rebel much to the Romans is, in my opinion, due to the fact that um, Rome already controlled all the other, um, like the Nubians normally, they exported towards uh, Arabia as well. Mm, but at that point, the most convenient market would be towards the Mediterranean. Now, the Romans controlled the whole Mediterranean coast of Africa. So, um, at that point, it would be kind of silly to basically, um, like, contend the Romans a, uh, uh, you know, to, to stop trade, essentially, because at that point, the Romans, would, the, the, the especially the, all the goods that arrived from Black Africa, would pass from other, uh, through other routes, right, and the, the Ethiopians would have lost the initiative. And uh, the same goes for the the axis east west, like we, we you know, um, the Bab al Mandab Strait, you know, is, is there. So if you if you block the imports towards Europe, you you lose an enormous amount of money. Who would buy that? Like, doesn't make sense. So that's the reason why actually these peoples remained quite obedient, and up to the third century, in fact, there was no change in in this regard. Um, the mm, and the Roman occupation of these regions uh, along the Nile would also change um, something in the internal policy of Ethiopia itself because the Meretic state to tended now to gravitate more towards the south. Um, the capital um, would be, in fact, Meroe, not, not Napata anymore. So uh, this naturally uh, means that they had to leave room for, for the Romans. And this was a great another great success actually because now the Romans controlled very deep and far into into Africa into northeastern Africa and Augustus um, even by maintaining good diplomatic relations with the Meroitic state founded more uh, steadily the safety of the Roman domination of Egypt right it was probably the single most important one you know the Egypt was organized by Augustus with a very uh, direct control uh, of the princeps on on uh, on the province, right? Because the, the nobody could like um, intervene in the, the, the granary of the empire without uh, without a monarchic control. Um, the crisis of of uh, Roman Nubia would actually occur only from the third century, when the Meridic kingdom would fall under the pushes of the Blemmi that were these populations living in the mountain ridges um, between 
yeah, the, 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 the Nile Valley and the, and the Red Sea. Um, and these were, in fact, uh, quite different populations. They, they were s essentially semi-nomadic populations. And they, they what, what is fascinating, as for Europe telling the truth, is that these peoples would uh, emerge uh, during the 3rd century, after, centru uh, after a very long time of uh, s subjugation, like without any particular trouble, which speaks for the crisis of the 3rd century. Uh, and the also the arousal of romanization of certain areas that had remained obedient for, for quite a long time. Um, only Diocletian um, solved the problem of the blemmy um, and, uh, and bringing to Phila uh, the frontier and um, settling the nobads in the Dodecas Koinos area, like a kind of a buffer people. Um, but as we were seeing at the beginning of the video, the actually the greatest difficulty that is, that is deeply overlooked in this regard, in my opinion, of the uh, Roman policy was the arrangement of Europe, right, in Europe. Because essentially, let's be honest, we, t we talked just about the, the Parthians and the Germans as the, the Germans as just the Germans and as if there was nothing around them. And as if the Romans hadn't been struggling for 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 decades at that point to to bring m many other areas of Europe under their control, um, so from this point of view, um, we can recognize, as we have seen at the beginning, that Augustus really founded Roman Europe. Uh, as such, right? Caesar hadn't quite accomplished that. Caesar had naturally seized Gaul because of internal political affairs um, for him, for, for having an army essentially to march on Rome. Um, but Gaul wasn't pacified yet. It, uh, Gaul would remain under Roman control pretty, pretty well. It was Gaul was one of the greatest successes of Romanization in absolute terms. Um, but still, at this time, the situation wasn't that, that easy, right? Uh, there wasn't even a, a massive difference, objectively, tr between certain s Celtic populations and some certain Germanic ones, and there wasn't even a real border. Like, the Rhine, yes, it's a big thing, but come on, y it's not really... I mean, this broad Atlantic plains and then the other Central European areas are kind of too vast and too also diverse uh, in part to, to be single blocks. There are, it depends like w w which parameter we want to take into account. Um, and there is a lot in fact in, in, Aug in the Augustine political propaganda referred specifically to uh, to these areas, right? And, and they were probably th really the most important. Sometimes we think that I mean, since these peoples that Rome conquered were kind of weaker um, politically than um, and then the great kingdoms and empires of the East, well, um, we we tend to underestimate what what it meant effectively to conquer these areas. Like, of course, um, the military average wasn't that that great. Like, we we tend to think that. Um, I don't know that there is this intrinsic uh, capacity of uh, barbarian tribes to be kind of at the levels of, of crashing Rome in open field just because they were tough in charges and stuff like that. Were but actually the, the military average was pretty low, right? It, technically speaking, even conquering Germany had been fairly easy. Um, the Romans underestimated them as a consequence. Like the, the main problem was really the territory as such, and these peoples meant as multitudes of 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 uh, of humans that uh, that were kind of difficult to 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 balance altogether like especially like the goals were many the, the the Germans were many and therefore you couldn't simply exterminate everything you could you also had to if you really wanted to incorporate these areas you had to uh, to offer them something in exchange and the, the the deal of romanization was was not that obvious for many peoples, and that's also why we can't f f f formally distinguish the, the Celts and the Germans. Because technically speaking, you know, think just about if the Teutoburg Forest would have not happened. Like probably the Romans would have had more problems than 
Dan advantages actually was pretty positive that for the empire that that Germany was not occupied but the uh, contrarily wise to what lots of people I don't know why fanatically keep on saying like ah, the Romans should have conquered Germany that it would have been so easier right afterwards it would have not been why do you think that why it is actually not true it might have been actually a greater problem that you imagine um, but aside from this um, the uh, the the real challenge was in fact giving something in in exchange like providing the, the integration of these people so caesar as you know um had been an advocate for this he wrote the the bello gallico not not much just to celebrate his deeds which you know there was the the, the traditional formal way to do that with triumphally etc um, it was actually the, the bello gallico is a, is a work to show the roman uh, elites that People's like the the Gauls, for example, could be could be integrated, and had to be integrated. It could give uh, much to Rome if they had been ef effectively um, accepted into the Roman order, um, not as uh, just vanquished, but you know, as uh, as corruptible uh, aristocracies. And now we we can't open this parenthesis. We will have to do it some sometimes uh, soon in another moment. You know, like what what was the deal in terms of even now with in Augustan times with imperial policy and um, and the integration of foreigners. Like Augustus, under this point of view, technically speaking, was was very balanced. Like he was fairly you know it it, it hadn't easy at all. Like Augustus' life was uh, terrifying. Like he, he suffered so many losses. He suffered enormously as an individual. It, it was an, uh, an enormous uh, continuous struggle. But in this sense, um, the effort towards, um, like, for convincing the senatorial elite to accept his elites w were more moderate compared to, I don't know, to, to Caesar, for example, or even Claudius, for example. But we will see it. Um, on another occasion uh, the real problem for Augustus was quite different he was actually military you know he had f in the first place to subdue these populations and that wasn't easy at all and that's where Agrippa was the the, the tutelar saint in, that, in this context because if it hadn't been for him like things would have been Agrippa was a man of ex extraordinary caliber let's say he was uh, everything he was a you know politician and military man an architect, he he he, uh, he had an enor an, in an enormous uh, enormously resourceful individual. Um, the Roman Empire owes a lot to to Agrippa, and um, so what what we could say, um, for example, let's start from from Spain. You know that the Romans basically had invaded Spain since the times of the Second Punic War, and they had. Um, it, it it had taken a lot of resources from from the republic to to be conquered as a as a province. Um, the the north, uh, especially the most heavily Celticized north of Spain, was was basically free. Like the the, the Romans had never ventured far north. They had been content with controlling the by far richer and more uh, evolved south that new you know much greater civilization and uh, in fact that's where roman civilization was spread in spain and uh, this large mm, peninsula being largely in fact mm, uh, it was massively romanized of course but it, it at the point that they would switch from celtic or iberian to to to, to a romance language locally but the the north and, and other areas were left kind of bit on their own the problem is that these peoples were troublesome. They launched the, the usual raids from the north. The, the, this is the history of Spain in a nutshell. Like as, as long as there was a an invader, that that was the problem was, and and therefore these campaigns were not much. Um, they were merely they had a, a strictly strategic uh, significance because they weren't aimed at just gaining new territory and, and riches because these were freaking depressed lands actually nobody would have 
uh, cared about them if these guys hadn't constantly harassed the, the more civilized South. Um, so by eliminating this problem, they could have made uh, grow the the surrounding areas much much faster, right? And these Cantabrian and Asturian campaigns lasted ten years, right? It was also some he Augustus came to to control them um, uh, personally. He he spent a lot of time in Spain, um, and in Gaul as well, telling the truth, controlling in person the uh, the work of Agrippa. These were terrifying uh, uh, wars uh, lasting from 29 to 19 BC, uh, and they were successful. Right, um, the Romans made it to kind of pacify these regions uh, in the uh, hardest way they they, they could. And we know that the Romans were pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good at doing that. Telling the truth. What I would like to make you understand in these stories is that, uh, in my opinion, there is always a civilized. Like I'm, in this context, I, I understand the Roman perspective as much as, of course, I understand the perspective of these people that just wanted to do what they wanted. But I, I kind of more a fan of Rome, simply because you know there e there was objectively a more civilized intention in trying to to pacify the situation it was just about stealing and raping and destroying but the point is that if you if you don't do that at one point these peoples will keep on harassing you and at that time you can't say okay let's raise them to the ground and that's what happened and and this is the value of of civilization. Never never think that civilization comes simply like going picking flowers and being happy and and cute and sweet. No, sometimes civilization passes through massacring literally everyone and making an enormous bath of blood, right? And and this has always been so. Um, it, unfortunately, and uh, I'm not saying that this is what we should be doing all the time, but there are certain cases in which. That is objectively the best option. It is fortunately a couple of you know kind of rare occasions, um, but it happens. And and if you it's simply you know if it's wall against wall, uh, there's not much left to like. If you don't want, don't want to obey, if you don't want to cut it off, you're done for. And and the proof that the Romans were doing this is objectively that these areas weren't even particularly Romanized afterwards. Like the Romans didn't care of making the East their homeland. They were interested in the reaches of uh, the Baetica region, for example. Um, the north was not on its own, as long as you didn't bother, right? And that was it. And this proves that, that it was just about making these guys cutting it off, and it worked, right? On the value of violence and civilization. Um, but and then th the other big problem that is often overlooked and overshadowed, especially by the the Western Germans, by the Ingaivones, by the Armenians, and this guys that had been conquered by Rome fairly easily by at this point, as we will see now, uh, were the Marcomanni, in what would be today's um, like more or less Czech Republic. Let's put it in this way: these were uh, essentially a Germanic, uh, let's, let's say Celtic hybrid. Right, they were actually the most advanced Germans. The Marcomanni were a pretty tough confederation that, as you know, would also remain there up to uh, in the time of the second century, uh, late second century, uh, giving troubles to Rome at one point, invading even Italy, etc. And they were objectively a threat. Like these were just north of the Alps; they're they're a step from Italy, and and they're they're a powerful um, group. They they have a lot of the, their elites are are wealthy, they're advanced. They have been massively Celticized in part, even military technique. They have cavalry, uh, differently from Western Germans that make usually a poor use of cavalry, even though they have individually good one. The Marcomanni have a lot of it, and um, that is pretty damn good, especially when you have to raid the whole Danubian area that the Romans were trying to even to bring under pretty slowly. Um, and um, so the Romans were particularly worried by the Marcomanni, and the actual, I mean, even the invasion of Germany actually was subordinated to the elimination to the elimination of the Marcomanni, right? All this deal of conquering the world, Germany up to the Elbe River was actually 
mm, for, for the sake of attacking the Marcomanni, like with a pincer movement between, like from from the south, the Danubian area in what with today like today's Austria, Hungary, those areas, and from uh, from Germany, like from Gaul, from Germany, um, and that was it. Like that's how it, it it was actually happening, and it was an enormous preparation. It actually reveals the the very thorough strategical planning and vision that the Romans had at this point. Um, and also how they, they didn't actually mm, consider the, the the Gallic and Germanic areas as so dramatically threatening after all, because their lines of communication were, were exposed in that regard. Um, that would be, in fact, a mistake in part, um, meaning that the, the invasion, like... The Roman Augustus committed his best generals, Tiberius, Drusus. Tiberius was one of the greatest generals of the ancient world. Nobody cares about it, uh, but like Drusus had been, the, had conquered Germany, and now they were la launching their the, uh, the offensive. But the the Illyrian revolt broke out, right? And the Illyrian revolt was a massive, like it was a total mess. The Romans had to to re uh, to redeploy all their troops to to crush the, the, the so-called Batonian Rebellion that uh, was in territories that were actually were pretty tough grounds. Um, that was another bath of blood. It took a lot for the Romans to restore order, but basically the invasion of, uh, of Marcomania was, was aborted. Like, there wasn't even a, a place like the, the Marcomania. There, would, there, were, there was the Boiaenum, like, it would, would give the name from, to Bohemia, like, from the boy that had inhabited them and the Germans eventually uh, kind of conquering them, I mean, assimilating them. Uh, but that this, the Illyrian Revolt, in turn, triggered the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, itself because actually the Romans were retreating at that point from from uh, from uh, from the heart of Germany were they were caught in that in that ambush but we'll see it a, a little bit better now um, so uh, the conquest of free Germany was a Caesarian trait in Augustian policy right uh, it wasn't just about mm, pacifying Gaul it was also by keeping the Germans at bay right uh, this was the whole deal why the Romans had intervened in, in, in Gaul in the first place, formally. Caesar had went there to defend the Gauls from the German invasion um, that had crossed the Rhine and uh, wanted to threaten to, to subdue the whole Gaul. The Romans, um, like at this point of Augustus, had suffered one century before the same Teutonic invasions that had arrived up to Noricum, Spain, Italy itself, were between... Um, you know, the, the Narbonensis and, and Cisalpingo, the, the, the Romans had eventually massacred the, the, the Germans. Um, but the, the Teutonic episode wa was actually a big thing that had kind of made the, the Roman... The Battle of Arousia was the, the bloodiest of all Roman defeats ever, like historically speaking. Um, those people would name Adrianople or Cannae. No, it was at the hands of uh, of the Germans at Arausio, and uh, the, the Romans had always been had remained kind of uh, you know traumatized by that experience. I mean, the, the, until Caesar went in in Gaul and 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 uh, destroyed uh, Ariovistus' army and eventually entered in Germany to slaughter a bunch of tribes and coming back, uh, the the myth of the, this blonde uh, red-haired giants that arrived and massacred and destroyed everything was, was actually a, a, a sound Roman um, concern. And, um, and Caesar had proven otherwise, uh, because objectively he had contained the Germans that, after all, yes, they had launched some raid and skirmish along the Rhine and stuff, but, you know, since Caesar had showed them who ruled in there, they they hadn't created much of a problem. In fact, as we were saying before, the Romans actually didn't consider the Germans uh, at that point as particularly um, effective, militarily speaking. In fact, Germany was conquered fairly easily. Um, the problem was afterwards. The problem was Romanization. Right? It wasn't a military problem. It was actually a political problem, a social problem. Um, 
Julius Caesar had uh, already revealed in his commentary the forested world of the Germans. And now Augustus was trying to inherit this, for this part, the policy of conquest, right? While renouncing to the legacy of the Caesarian plans for Parthia, as we have seen before. Um, it was an important choice, as we have um, highlighted. Uh, and this, mm, you know, th there was a preparation necessary against the Germans, right? Um, the, the surrounding areas weren't completely pacified. Drusus and Tiberius had been sent against the Rathians in what would be today's um, roughly Switzerland, uh, Western Austria, Southern Germany. Uh, in 15 BC, um, the Gauls had been reorganized administratively between 16 and 13 BC. Uh, in 12 BC, uh, on August the first, um, Dru Drusus dedicated the Ara Romae at uh, Augusti at uh, Lyon, uh, Lugdunum, the center of the Gallia Lug Lugdunensis. In fact. Um, and Drusus, as you know, was uh, one of the favorites of Octavian. He was his stepson, technically, even though there were voices that, um, because he had married uh, Livia by making her divorce from, from his um, husband, and w when she was pregnant, and some people say, you know, that Drusus, for this reason, was Augustus' son, like uh, biologically. Um, while well Tiberius that was the older um you know brother of Drusus was of course not his own and and Augustus d d didn't like much Tiberius in fact he was pretty distressed when eventually all of these young men um hares died and he had to to eventually give to t Tiberius the but um and these were good great commanders actually and and and, and a lot. That think about how much was on the shoulder of these people. I mean, these these were the hairs of of the future empire. It was an enormous exaltation. Just thinking, even uh, Julia, uh, Augustus' daughter, she was like she felt like well, uh, rightfully the the most important uh, woman as um, you know as a promise of 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 the empire, this great dynasty. And there was an immense. The Romans had an immense. Um, sense of themselves and their prestige, their their lineage, their, their blood, right? The fact that they were uh, uh, the lineage of Caesar, right? Augustus Caesar, and and uh, these were the men who had, you know, with this, uh, you know, who were to take the control of the world. Just think about this, right? These weren't just random; they, they were bred in in the cult of. The, of of the military strength of of this um, imperial religiosity that entailed the conquest. All these campaigns were 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 harsh, that hard, because the, the Romans knew that they they were entitled now to those lands, right? And that's also f what the underestimation of certain foes eventually came uh, from. Um, Drusus had uh, dedicated, as we've seen. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, the this dedicated this temple at Lyon that was eventually followed by the conquest of Germany up to the Elbe um, by Drusus' command, in fact, in between 12 and 9 BC, right? So fairly easy, fairly easy from Germany to the Elbe, like in three years. It's a lot. If you think with with Gaul, is is more or less the, with Caesar. It was basically the same speed. Just for saying, even as we were saying before, this myth of you know the the, the, the problem, the, the strictly military problem, wasn't that much. The Romans could conquer easily vast amounts of territory. The problem was maintaining them. And like it's naive to believe that I don't know certain lands ah couldn't be conquered. Well, with Germany, it happened. Uh, with Scotland, it didn't because the Romans simply said, "Okay, we won't give a damn about it." But you know, it's not because locally speaking, they were supermen that uh, kept the Romans out. It, it, it didn't happen like that. Um, this is basically eliminating deep political, socio-economical matters that 
of the local populations, etc., that nobody really cares. It's all about uh, who was the strongest, who was the coolest. No, here, really, the strongest thing you could ever find in front of you was a Roman legion, right? And this is what happened to these peoples. They were literally conquered and uh, brutally, like, we, we know that these conquests were brutal as they could be, right? So there is nothing poetic, nothing glorious in the kind of human um, sense, uh, aside from the, the civilization backing these expeditions, meaning that, you know, the Romans could do this because they were the Romans, right? All the peoples at the time slaughtered, raped, uh, and and robbed, and whatever. Uh, every single one of them. Simply the Romans did better than others. And, and that's the, the key of explaining all of this. The, these other populations were anything better, right? And uh, Which doesn't mean they deserved it, or maybe they did, who knows. If they had already done it to, to someone else, <laughs> you know, who cares? Um, but of course, the, it's not that simple either, morally speaking. Um, ju just for saying that... Um, I like to stress how qu quickly Germany was conquered to, to to parallel it with how quickly it was lost at the same time. So because that, in absence of more precise information, gives you a quantitative dimension of, you know, the failure of the construction of a, a Roman territorial domination in countries like, like this one, um, like in Germany specifically, um, because of the particular conditions of the local peoples. Um, so, the to, to make it even more interesting in this sense is probably there wasn't much of a, of a difference in Roman mindset between the Gauls and, and Germans, or better. Th there actually was. I mean, this is proven by the terms in which Caesar wrote about and how um, later historiography wrote about these peoples. Of course, Gaul was very different from Germany, etc. The, the point is that, as we also m explained in other videos, is that, you know, the, the difference was mostly uh, in terms of cohesion, right? Uh, these populations lived more or less in, in similar ways. Like, n not all of Gaul was so advanced and rich like the, say, central and southern Opida, for example. Um, not all of Germany was totally um, savage, let's say, but on average it, it was more or less like this, but the, the, the limit, the boundary was, was loose. And uh, the Romans saw the domination of Gaul and the victory over the Germans as two interdependent realities, right? But in 9 BC, Drusus died. Uh, it remained, however, the the hope, or better, the certainty that the successes of Drusus would have not gone lost um, in in these territories, and that the border could man could be maintained up to the Elbe River, or at least up to the Vesa River. I in the meanwhile, Tiberius had subjugated between 12 B.C. and 9 B.C. Um, Possibly connected with the Ovatio of the Ovatio actually of 16 January BC uh, of 8 BC, um, the Pannonians in 8 uh, BC um, he had also taken the conduct of the, the Pannonic campaigns were pretty tough, right? Another th this committed lots of Roman legions. It was a massive operation, because these were pretty tough and cohesive populations, um, also kind of wilder than the average Celts that the Romans had met in Gaul, for example, so it, it was, uh, was not easy. And so at that point, when Drusus died, it was Tiberius that took the lead on, on, on the Germanic uh, war, and in 7 BC he celebrated a triumph over the Germans. In um, the modern uh, city of Cologne was founded the Ara Ubiorum, right? Uh, this were this was a Roman colony that also allied with certain the Ubi. In fact, it was a Germanic population, uh, or maybe Celto Germanic with the pants, but they were considered Germans um, that had a typical correspondency 
as the ara proper, that is the altar, um, with the altar of Rome and Augustus at Lyon that Drusus had dedicated to. And the, the great conquest of Germany at this point seemed ensure, right? Uh, it, Drusus' legacy was safe thanks to the commander skills of Tiberius that objectively did a, a good job. And in 45 AD, Tiberius um, had in fact gained um, quite of a first, uh, had come in the foreground in the political life of the empire and he resumed the Germanic campaign arriving up to the Elbe, right, and consolidating th further th this border. But it was observed uh, at that point anyway, the, the difficulty to reconcile the Germanic conquests with the Danubian problems, right? Um, Consider that the, the, the Romans at this point were, had been expanding towards the Danube, and especially towards M Moesia, or Mesia if you prefer. Um, there is this land um, essentially in between today's um, Trace, Romania, uh, Trace, oh my god, Bulgaria, <laughs> excuse me, um, reasoning in ancient terms. Um, Bulgaria, Romania, like uh, on the Danube, on the Serbia in part, that is basically the only fertile land along the Danube. Like, literally, like, if you look at the Roman Empire, the only fertile lands were there, so that's also what favored, eventually, the conquest of Dacia, uh, because they, they were just in front of the Dacians, and that was kind of a problem, but aside from the mines that the Dacians had that the Romans wanted to seize. Uh, but let's say that the Danubian frontier was, it's probably the most radically underestimated in the world of Roman history, I think, in pop culture, like, the Danubian area was of, uh, was always the, the real problem of Rome in many, in many ways uh, on the long run, and um, this mm, let's say uh, what was the problem really? It's that the strategic possibility to preserve the conquests up to the Elbe was given just if the Romans had been safe from the side of the Danube, right? And that's where actually the attack toward against the Marcomanni took place, because in 6 AD, uh, from the Catech and Pannonian regions against the, uh, the Marcomanni, uh, whose king was Marabod, famously, uh, the Romans launched uh, an offensive that, um, you know, had to resolve the situation. But that's essentially, as we were saying before, when the Pannonian Rebellion began, or the Illyrian Rebellion, if you prefer, between 6 and 9 AD. And Tiberius had to, at that point, to, to revert instead the north than south. Um, and that's at the end of this that Arminius, in 9 AD, right, um, uh, called to the rebellion this Germanic populations of especially the West. Arminius, as it's largely known, he had been raised in Rome, he was um, a Roman soldier, and uh, however he had preserved his Germanic, let's say, national conscience, I mean national meant in, in the Latin term, uh, the sense of the word, let's say. Um, so Arminius, of course, was evidently a product, like a failure of, of Romanization, like his brother was actually a centurion in the Roman army that remained, f stayed faithful uh, to Rome, up to even during Arminius' um, uh, rebellion, and uh, the Battle of Teutoburg Forest uh, was, was a masterpiece in many ways. Um, it, it, it was a miracle, like, we're like bringing these tribes together that, that had a very low um, sense of common identity, if any at all, um, w was really it really proved the value of this chieftain, right? That knew how to exploit the Ro uh, the Roman weaknesses. He also was, you know, capable and lucky as always, because all great commanders are capable and lucky al as always. Um, and this was a great. Uh, 
Now, this was a heavy insult. Like, aside from, we could talk about this this event for hours, maybe one day we will talk, in fact, about the Battle of Tudor Force. It will happen, I can tell. But, uh, it's the symbolism behind this. It's we, we ha I made a, a video of two hours and a half discussing, like, what it could be uh, if there was a, a Germanic identity at this time. It actually wasn't. There, there wasn't. Like It was more like the Romans that objectively were fully entitled to distinguish the Germans from other peoples, but the Germans didn't know they were Germans, right? Um, they, um, they didn't feel this, but it was, in fact, a world where there were shared values, not just between the Germans, but, but also with all the other peoples, including Rome. So the Germans, w as we were saying before, didn't weren't didn't give up their freedom. They, they didn't think that Rome was to stay there. Like uh, the Romans had began to assimilate the the Germanic aristocracies and in part had started cooperating, etc. But um, the the possibility of of Romanizing Germany at this point was very. It would have taken at least a much longer time and resources and. Um, they weren't ready, right? So, uh, on the contrary, they saw the Romans as conquerors because that's what they were, of invaders, I mean, uh, that had come in their land, in their sacred places, and started dictating their own uh, demands. And, uh, and, and this was felt as a, as a challenge to, to the same deities. Like, what the Romans loved in this sense is that was the ancient um, vanquisher's rule like who wins is entitled to win because he has earned it right and and this was the what the deal was about like the Romans owned at this time the monopolium let's say on um, on the military uh, let's say it's difficult to define let's say on the the military glory of the skies um, the Germans were impressed. They thought that they were the bravest, that they weren't inferior to Rome. They were sure about it. So they fought and, and they won in this battle. It was more of like an ambush, but it doesn't change much of, of the, 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 the substance because, you know, what's the difference at the end of the day? Because you think that fighting in an ambush is easier than fighting in open field. It, it's not really like that. Um, it takes much more skill, right? And aside from from this, the, um, th there was an evident promise that the Germans also thought of themselves like they, they owned, like the, the idea of victory that would never abandon them. One of the most powerful symbols in this regard was that the priest of the Ara Ubiorum itself, Segimund, son of the Romanizing Segestus, right, that had accepted Romanization in this sense, um, brought like he he took away the sacerdotal bands of of the ara and he fled uh, back to, to to germany right to to the rebels as the romans said and that's where in the forest uh, like uh, you know, the, the, the in the august of 9 ad um a teutoburg uh, arminius won over the Roman commander Varus and three legions were annihilated, famous story. Um, and that's when the possibility of Romanizing free Germany was compromised. The Battle of Teutoburg marked, uh, we can't say forever, like in, in insight, of course, it, it wouldn't happen, the Romans would actually invade Germany. It happened actually under Maximin the Thracian, but in a completely different situation, doesn't, can't be put in comparison. Marcus Aurelius was actually try to invade Germany again, but he died uh, just before. And the mm, and just for saying that the Romans never quite abandoned the idea, like th this fact of Germany would require like an entire video to explain properly. I've made a few other videos about this topic, but never quite specifically on it. We don't have the time to discuss it now. But um, this is. Uh, let's say mm, there are many implications like mm, the Battle of Teutoburg Forest at the time probably mostly symbolized in the Augustan um, vision the uh, 
the end of Drusus' conquest. Like this was the the deal. Drusus had died. Like this this was a huge failure. They were seeing the Romans being also quite superstitious, like these other barbarians, that they thought it was a bad omen. Uh, I mean, Augustus had a tough life. He had a you know he didn't have a male son. All of his heirs were kind of uh, they they died. The son of his um, sons of his daughter. Um, this other stepsons that he stepson that he loved, and uh, he had uh, like it was a tough moment. Um, and the the Battle of Tudorburg Forest came at the end of a li of an extraordinary life of a man that really probably is the single most important individual historically speaking after Alexander the Great. I mean, in terms of legacy objectively this this can't be denied but um i i presume that we should expand this like of of course i don't know for example in uh, the roman border if the roman frontier let's say better came back on the rhine and the danube right in flavian times there would have been the this correction of the Agri Decumatus in southwestern Germany was an, were annexed by the Romans. But in, in any way, Germanic Europe basically was detached from the direct Roman domination. And, and this this is the, the true meaning of the Battle of Tudorburg Forest. And it is enormous. And of course, today we, we can't, um, we can't uh, expand on this. But you you understand what these implications are, and what it, this entails. Um, okay, and I'm sorry to leave you like this because I know you deserve more, more and better. But I think uh, that uh, just just think of what this meant just for one second in in the plan of a person who believes to 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 rule the, the entire world for real and that he, more than that he has a divine mission to do it it's not a modern view of like oh, i conquered the world cold no you 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 think that the whole universe basically is revolving around what you do and and it, it was true at the time so never underestimate this aspect and we will expand on it we'll make a massive ft video about not just the battle of tudorburg force but uh, also others about the Roman conquest of Germany, the, the loss of Germany, and the relations it's, uh, with this area of province. And, um, alright, I, I don't even uh, send you to other videos I made, because I presume at this point it, they're very easy to search. And, alright, I just, for now we stop here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like. Or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now. I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.